Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness and for your goodness. Your kindness, Lord. Lord, we just overwhelm, Lord. And Lord, we come, Lord, and we present ourselves to you this morning. Offering up our worship to you, Lord.
into your marvelous light oh god you set us free oh god you open up your hands oh god lord the whole earth is satisfied with good oh god father we have tasted and we have seen your goodness oh god and this morning oh god lord with all of our hearts with all of our minds oh god with all of our souls and all of our strength oh god lord we say you are good you have never failed oh god 
You have never let us down, oh God. You have been faithful, oh God, through the seasons, oh God. Your love has been constant, oh God, day in and day out, oh God. Your faithfulness, oh God, never fails, oh God. Your mercies, oh God, are new every morning, oh God, Lord. And this morning, oh God, we are church, oh God. We come before you, God. And God, we just bring you praise, oh God. We ascribe to you all the honour, all the glory, and all the praise, oh God. And we offer up our lives to you, oh God. As a living sacrifice, oh God. Lord, out of all that we have received, oh God, Lord, this morning, oh God, we offer up our lives to you, God. Let it be a pleasing sacrifice, oh God. Lord, let it be a pleasing aroma unto you, oh God. Because all we want to do this morning, oh God, is just to honour you, to give you praise to give you all the glory for all that you have been and done to us. God, we thank you. We just want to say we love you. We honour you and we're just so grateful, God, for all that you have done for us and all that you have been to us. God, we thank you, God. We love you. We honour you and all God's people say, Amen. Come on, let's give God a mighty praise in this place. God has been so good to us. Amen. Amen and Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our tent. 10.15 a.m. service at Cornerstone Katong. Uh, you may take your seats. Feel free to give the people around you a friendly wave or a high five. And thank you as well for those who are tuning in online and joining us from all over the world. We welcome you. Well, if this is your first time here with us, we'd like you to know that you are our very valued guest. And on behalf of everyone here in Cornerstone, we'd like to extend a very warm Cornerstone welcome to you. As a matter of fact, we have a very special drink, a special welcome drink that we have for you. And all we need you to do is just to scan the QR code on the screen, select a drink of your choice, and you can collect it at the Next Steps Lounge at Level 2, where our friendly team will be very happy to find out more about you, to meet you, and get to know you more as well. Now, for the rest of us who may not be here for the first time, but if you'd like to find out more about your Next Steps, we have got you covered. So do head over to our Next Steps Lounge as well. Our friendly team will be happy to share with you uh, about your next steps in this journey of faith. Amen. Well, last week, our Cornerstone Community uh, Services presented an amazing report of all the good things that they have done as well as the impact that they have made in the community. And part of the work that we are doing is actually an ongoing outreach to the migrant workers led by our Telugu pastor, Pastor Nelson. And the migrant outreach includes weekly wellness sessions at different recreation centres as well as monthly workshops conducted by our many of our church members, you know, who impart life skills skills and very, very relevant knowledge as well. And of course, there is also the annual celebration of various events and not forgetting the barn at Panjuru. Now, at a recent Partners Appreciation event conducted by the Ministry of Manpower, Cornerstone Community Services was called out and acknowledged as one of the many prominent partners out of the 160 NGOs. So we really want to give God thanks. Yes, let's just offer our thanks to God. And um, Cornerstone Community Services was also presented a Certificate of Appreciation by Senior Minister of State, Dr. Ko Po Kun. So we really thank God for the many opportunities that we have to really serve the community and be a blessing in this nation. Amen. Well, the School of Ministry has commenced its 17th term at the Bible College of Wales. Uh, and we have students from all seven different nations represented this time round. And we are really excited to see what God will do in and through our students. So please do keep them in prayer. Now, some of us may be inquiring, you know, might, might be wondering about the School of Ministry and want to find out more. Well, do head over to our website at bcwales.org or follow us on our Instagram page because more details are on the website. Well, next Sunday is going to be really exciting as well because we'll be having our combined service next Sunday at the Singapore Expo Hall 1. So this is a friendly reminder that there will be no weekend services at the Katong or the Bugis sites. So please do not come to the Katong or Bugis sites. Instead, join us next Sunday at Singapore Expo Hall 1. Service starts at 10 a.m. promptly, but we'd like to encourage you to come a little earlier at 9 a.m. to join us for an early bird breakfast. It's going to be a great time of food and fellowship with the pastors, leaders, and 
and all of us church members. It'll be a wonderful time. So I'll see you there at 9 a.m. Okay, at a Singapore Expo Hall one for breakfast with, with service starting at 10 a.m. And next week, we're actually going to be having uh, Christine Kane as well as Pastor Yang bring the words. So it's going to be an amazing time. It's uh, something that you definitely do not want to miss. Well, we are serving a notice for an extraordinary general meeting on the 14th of March to authorize the board to submit a tender for the land parcel at Tampany Street 86. And all the Easties say, Yay! Amen! Okay, let's hope this goes through. Okay, so this meeting is open to all members of Cornerstone Community Church. No registration is required, so come do join us if you like to. Well, over the next two weeks, we will be sending out two teams to the mission fields. They will be going to Indonesia as well as the Philippines. Let's do keep them in prayer. Uh, and we will also be praying for them at the end of the announcements as well. Well, last but not least, we would like to give unto the Lord our tithes and our offerings. We've got offering, offering buckets placed at the exits. As you make your way out, you can drop in your tithes and offerings. Alternatively, you can also give via pay now or credit card. Well, that's all that we have. Let's take some time to pray for the offering, shall we? Father, we just thank you, God, Lord, for your goodness, your kindness, and your abundance, O oh God, of love towards us, O oh God. Lord, we, we acknowledge, O oh God, Lord, that all that we have comes from you, O oh God, and of your very own, O oh God, do we offer to you, Lord, this morning our tithes and our offerings, O oh God. Father, I pray that you will bless it, that you multiply it for the extension of your kingdom and the glory of your name. And God, we also want to commit, O oh God, Lord, the two teams that will be going out to the mission fields, God. Father, we ask, O oh God, Lord, even for the blood of Jesus to cover them and their families. Families. God, we pray that you anoint them, oh God, Lord, even as they go forth, that they will go forth in the might and the power of the Holy Spirit, oh God, seeing signs and wonders, oh God, demonstrated among their midst, oh God. And we pray, oh God, Lord, that your love and your presence will be so tangibly felt, not just by the team, but by the people they're ministering to, oh God, that in all things, oh God, that you will get the honour and the glory, oh God. So Lord, we just thank you. We just uh, lift up the rest of the service into your hands. We pray, God, Lord, that you will be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've got a video coming right up before Reverend Edmund Chan comes to bring us the word. So sit back and be blessed. Hey church, it's so good having you with us again. We're rolling into March and here's what's coming up. It's our combined service next weekend. Guest speaker Christine Kane will be taking the stage. And Mary gave birth to Jesus and the centurion's servant was healed. The wise man found the Messiah, Peter walked on water, the woman with the issue of blood, she was healed, Paul and Silas, they got out of that prison cell, that little boy's lunch, he fed by thousand, and Jesus Christ got off that cross, and He defeated hell, and He defeated death, and He holds the keys to hell, and death, and church, my Bible says, the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, together with Pastor Yang and sharing on God's mandate for us from generation to generation. Don't miss this power-packed time on 10th March at 10 a.m. as we come together at the Singapore Expo Hall 1. And for the early birds, enjoy a hearty breakfast on us from 9 to 9.45 a.m. Do know that there will be no services or children's church at Cornerstone Kartong or Boogies that weekend. Step up on God's Word with a new term of training and equipping coming your way. Classes will be available both on-site and online starting in April. We have a whole list of exciting courses for you. Check them out on our website t &E page and sign up before registration closes on 26th March. The Cornerstone Internship Program for 2024 is still open for registration. Train yourselves through hands-on personal apprenticeship and nurture God's call upon your lives. Our new term will be starting in May. Visit cscc.org.sg. Next steps and internship for more registration and course details. Get your passports ready because we're getting set for our annual family camp happening from 10th to 13th June at Putrajaya, Malaysia. This year, we have four very special speakers lined up for you. And for those with young ones between 4 to 12 years old, we have an exciting children's program planned concurrently for them. Day Camper's registration is open and closes on 10 March, 11.59 p.m. Sign up fast! This week at FaithWorks, get your Bible study aids as we go through the book of Esther in our cell groups. Available in 
store or online at faithworks.com.sg. It's time for Giving to the Lord. For those who are on site, giving buckets are situated at the exits. Online giving options are also available on our website giving page. Download today's sermon slides on our website homepage or catch the link shown during the message coming up. Have a wonderful week ahead. Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. So good to see you and on this uh, 10, 15 a.m. service. Well, this morning, it's our joy and privilege to have Pastor Edmund Chan with us at the Cornerstone. Of course, Pastor Edmund needs no introduction and his family to us. And whenever he comes, he always blesses us with a fresh word from the Lord to give us a fresh perspective or it, to help us in our journey with the Lord. So without further ado, let's prepare our hearts. Let's put our hands together and give a warm Cornerstone welcome to Pastor Edmund Chan. It's such a distinct joy to be with you again. One of my favorite stories, because it's instructive, is of a man named James Humes, presidential speechwriter for three US presidents. He told the time he was in Moore College, and every student uh, would be very keen to queue up to sign up for a New Testament course taught by a retired Episcopalian priest. Not because he was a great lecturer, but because every final exam he asked the same question. The question is, tell us about the travels of the Apostle Paul. Until the time James Humes enrolled for the class, the professor changed the question. This time is not tell me about the travels of the Apostle Paul. Rather, is tell me about the Sermon on the Mount and critique it. The students didn't study, so they didn't do well except for a student by the name of Tiny. Don't know why they call him a Tiny. He's like an over six foot footballer, not very bright, but he scored an A. So these bright students like um, James Humes went around Tiny and said, we are surprised you know so much about the Sermon on the Mount. And this young man said, I don't have a clue. Then how do you score an A? He said, well, when I read the question, I said, Oh, who am I to critique the sermon of my master? <laughs> Instead, he said, let me tell you all about the travels of the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Can you imagine scoring an A for that? <laughs> Pat answers. There was a psalmist by the name of Asset who discovered that his pet answers could not navigate the contingent realities of life and his spiritual pilgrimage. His pet answer, his religious cliche, has no answer to the conundrum he faced. He recorded that spiritual experience for us in a song, and it is in Psalm 73 I'd like to explore with you today. The psalm began with an intriguing introduction. Look at verse 1 and verse 2. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet has almost stumbled and my steps have nearly slipped. Would you bow with me in prayer as we ask the Lord to bless our time together? Heavenly Father, open our eyes to behold wonderful truth out of your word and help us not just to be hearers of your word only, but do us also that we might grow thereby. We thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. But as for me, verse 2, is a contrast. The question is, what exactly was Asap contrasting? There are three possibilities. The first, he was contrasting himself with God. Surely God is good, but as for me, I am not good. Second possibility, he was contrasting himself with the pious Jews. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, but as for me, I am not pure in heart. Two possibilities, but I believe there is a third possibility I want to suggest to you. It's not contrasting himself with God or with the pious ones in Israel. I suspect it's more contrasting a religious cliché with the existential reality of life. In other words, the phrase, but as for me, is in my personal experience. How do I come to that conclusion? Well, that phrase, but as for me, 
was not just in the introduction, it's also in the conclusion of the psalm. Look at the last verse, verse 28. You have the same phrase there, verse 28, but as for me, it is good to be near God. In my personal experience, I discover it's good to be near God. So what he's doing, therefore, is to start with this religious proposition that all pious Jews are saying amen to, and then he says, in my personal experience, in contrast, this cliche, this pet answer doesn't work. And so the hearers were nudging one another to ask, why? Why does he say these things? And he gave the reason in verse 3. The reason is, verse 3, 4, that's a reason, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, he elaborates the prosperity of the wicked from verse 4 to verse 12. He tells us three things about the wicked. The first, they are prosperous. Look at verse 4. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. Now, if you go down Orchard Road, you go to a stranger and say, excuse me, don't mind. I politely tell you, your body is fat. No matter how polite you are, it's an insult. You get it? Now, in the Middle Eastern term, your body is fat is not an insult. It's an idiom to mean you are so prosperous. This is not just an e midi Middle Eastern term. In the Chinese language, you have the same idea. I'm Teochew. And in the Teochew language, you have Ching Pui, Ching Pu. Very fat, very prosperous. Same idea. They are prosperous. It's like, I don't understand. They are wicked. They are arrogant. And yet it's prosperous. It's not fair. It's like somebody in your company who is lazy, who is a liar, who takes credit of other people, uh, and then suddenly got promoted to everyone else. I mean, over everyone else. It's like, it's not fair. That's how the psalmist felt. How could they be prosperous? Especially when they're so proud. Look at uh, verse 6. Therefore, pride is their necklace. And violence cover them as a garment. They are prosperous and they're proud. And the third, they are powerful. Verse 8. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. How could this be? So now he has two inner struggles. The first inner struggle he has is, I give up, but I cannot give up. That's from verse 13 to verse 15. Look at how he says it. Verse 13, All in vain have I cut my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. In other words, what's the use? What's the use of clean living? What's the use of being holy when, when I, I see the wicked prospering? What's the use? I give up. Then he says, but I cannot give up. That's his first inner struggle. Want to give up, but cannot give up. Look at what he says in verse 15. If I have said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of thy children. I cannot speak like that. Why? Because he's not just the worship pastor of a mega church. He was the psalmist, the worship leader of an entire nation. I cannot speak like that. I cannot say, what's the use of being holy? So that was his first inner struggle. Reminds me of a story of a morning conversation in the kitchen between mother and son. Mother said to the son, son, you must go to school. Son said, I don't want to go to school. My teachers hate me. Son, you got to go to school. I don't want to go to school. The students hate me. And then the mother said, son, you got to go to school. You are the principal. He says, I cannot talk like that. I'm the worship leader of a nation. Get the dilemma, the frustration, the tension. So what does he do? Second inner struggle, he said, I try to understand, but I cannot understand. Look at verse 16. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. In other words, it's exceedingly grievous to my soul. I cannot Understand? Can you feel the tension and the dilemma, the conundrum the psalmist is in? Now, I believe that each time we go back to the Scriptures, it is important for us to see the big picture, connect the dots, see the big picture. So indulge me for a moment. Let me take you back to the introduction to give you the big picture 
and then show you the pivotal change that comes from verse 17 onwards, the second half of the psalm. But grabs the first half. The first half began with an intriguing introduction. It began with a religious cliche, a pet answer, a religious proposition. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. All pious Jews were saying amen to that. And then he circumvented the expectation, said something shocking in a manner of a personal confession. He said, but as for me in my personal experience, this is not so. And he gives the reason why in verse 3. He says, for I saw the arrogant, I saw the, the prosperity of the wicked. And he elaborates the, prosperity, uh, the, the wicked in three areas. Number one, they are prosperous. Number two, they are proud. And number three, they are powerful. As a result, he says there were two inner struggles he struggled with. Verse 13 to 15, I give up, but I cannot give up. So, verse 16, I try to understand, but I cannot understand. Can you sense the tension, the conundrum, as it was in? So how? What is he to do? Verse 17 is the pivotal verse. It changes everything. Verse 17 says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Here's the question. What did Asaph learn in the sanctuary of God that gave him a spiritual compass in his pilgrimage? What did he learn in the sanctuary of God that gave him perspective that gave him a sense that there is meaning to all these unfathomable things. He learned three lessons. Lesson number one, he learned that his evaluation of life was from the wrong perspective. That's from verse 18 to verse 20. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You have made them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment swept away utterly by terrors. Now, can you see the contrast? Earlier on, he says, I am close to stumbling. I nearly fall. I don't understand why the wicked prosper. Now, in the sanctuary of God, he gained perspective, not from the temporal, but from the eternal. He saw the swift and just judgment of God. Now, you must understand the severity of the condition Asaph was in as the psalmist. When he said, my step has almost stumbled, the word stumble is not an idea of a drunk stumbling around. That's not the picture. The picture in the Hebrew word nata is very graphic. Nata is to be spread out, to be stretched out. It's, it's a picture where a person falls and he's spread it, as it were, and, and it's basically, literally, I fall flat on my face. That's the picture. And spiritually applied in that picture, in that uh, idiom, it is to say, I have stumbled so badly that I fall. The word he used, my step almost stumble is so close to it in the Hebrew is emphatic in the word order almost and then he repeated that again you go back to verse 2 my steps nearly slipped why? because his perspective was on the temporal that's why now in the sanctuary of God, you see a contrast. And I shared with you before, when you study the Scriptures, pay attention to the contrast. The contrast teaches us a lot. Now in the sanctuary of God, he, his perspective is no longer on the temporal, but on the eternal. And from the eternal perspective, he gained an anchor for his soul. Before it was like my step almost slipped. It's almost as difficult as walking on oily marbled floor. I cannot keep my footing. Now his footing is secure in God in the sanctuary because his eyes are lifted to heaven. That's why the Apostle Paul says, set your minds on things above, not on things below. Things below give you perspective from the earthly. Things above give you perspective to the eternal. Makes a huge difference. Dr. Robert Clinton of Fuller Theological Seminary teaches on leadership. One of the questions he often asks the students on leadership is, what's the difference between a good leader and a bad leader? 
His answer, good perspective. Then he asked the second question, what's the difference between a good leader and a better leader? The answer, better perspective. Perspective changes everything. In the presence of God, in the sanctuary, our perspective are lifted up to the eternal and from the perspective of eternal, everything else changes. Perspective. We got to get our perspective right. There are two compromises to perspective. Two obstacles that, that uh, give clouds our perspective. Number one, our busyness. Number two, our forgetfulness. Let me tackle the first briefly, our busyness. I often say we rush here, rush there, we might as well be called Russians. <laughs> if you ask me, and I be, am I busy? My answer to you is yes, I hope meaningfully busy. Please understand, busyness itself is not a crime. There are two sides to the life and teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one side where he teaches restedness. He says, come apart and rest. But there's the other side where Jesus in his ministry, he was so busy, the Bible says, they don't even have time to eat. It's like, what about this inconsistency? You teach about restedness and then you minister until there's no time to eat. Listen carefully now. The key to our busyness is not whether we are busy, but what we are busy about and why. If we are not busy, the danger is we swing to the other side, we are lazy. So what is needed? The key word is intentionality. When we are clear, when there is clarity and intentionality, intentionality and clarity, I am about my father's business, that clarity and intentionality will help you steer the course of being not overly busy, but meaningfully busy. Otherwise, otherwise, our over-busyness can kill our perspective on the things that are eternal. Question, what are we busy about? Focus on the intentionality and the clarity that God gives in terms of His will, in terms of His leading. The second is forgetfulness. When we are forgetful, when God teaches lessons and then we are forgetful, we won't be able to see the eternal from the temporal. Why? We forget. Recently, there was something I forgot. It was not good for me. You see, years ago, I suffered a terrible backache because of an incident, an accident. And as a result, it, over the years, uh, I have occasionally some of this problem. Then, then there was a season, I, I have healing, I don't have this problem and I forget. I thought no pain doesn't mean uh, no injury. Sorry, I have learned no pain doesn't mean no injury. I thought, I don't face pain, therefore, there's no injury there. And so I've been, I've been taught, when you have back problems, you don't bend to pick up things. I was in Manila in January. We wanted to buy water uh, in the hotel room and Ense bought, buy some water. I didn't want to buy two bottles, one litre each, carry every time. So I look at this bottle, 10 litre. I say to myself, might as well buy one shot. Cheaper and easier. Don't have to climb up and down to the supermarket. I remember, bend your knees while you pick this up. What I forget is, while you bend your knees, your spine's supposed to be straight. I was bending my knees and bending down. When I picked it up, I felt this pain. I have to sit on the floor of the supermarket and call, and help. I forgot. Now apply to a spiritual life. Our forgetfulness, even though we learn it before, but our forgetfulness of our condition can compromise our perspective. That is why it's so important as I remember that I have to be careful. I travel a lot and so I be very careful when I take the baggage out of the uh, carousel, the, the back baggage claim. These are things I must remember because I must remember my condition. 
Now applied to the spiritual life, we must be cognizant of our spiritual wellness and our spiritual condition. I cannot be presumptuous. I cannot be presumptuous. My back has no pain, therefore it's okay. I cannot be presumptuous. Our spiritual life, spiritual well-being is okay. Question, are we in the sanctuary of God where we gain perspective in these things so that we do not forget? Lesson number one, his evaluation of life was from the wrong perspective. Lesson number two, his goal, he learned that his goal in life was of the wrong desire. Look at how he says it in verse 21, 22. When my soul was embittered, when I was prick in heart, I was brutish and ignorant, I was like a beast toward you. When my soul was embittered, there was a wrong desire within him that caused the bitterness within his soul. It's a fatal attraction. In other words, he saw the prosperity of the wicked and the reason why it troubled him was not because of the wicked. It was because of the prosperity. He wanted it as well. His going off in life was of the wrong perspective. His pursuit in life was of the wrong, sorry, was of the wrong desire. We have to watch the sanctification of our desires. Otherwise, the huge problem we have is consumerism. We assume material things can satisfy the soul. It doesn't. Applied to the spiritual pilgrimage and the spiritual life, there's such a thing as spiritual consumerism. Spiritual consumerism is when we think, if I do these things for God, if I minister, if I serve, if I lead, whatever, if I, what's in it for me? That's the question of consumerism. What's in it for me? And the antidote to spiritual consumerism and wrong desires is when we are focused upon God in His sanctuary so that we live for Him unto His purposes as we serve others in the name of Jesus. Then the focus is no longer upon ourselves. Some years ago, I was ministering in London. A dear old friend of mine, he's passed away since, is Richard Bue's... Um, former rector of All Souls. In other words, he took over uh, John Stock uh, in All Souls Church and then he retired. And he retired in Surrey. It's a small church he attends. And he said, can you come to my church to preach? I said, I'll be happy to. He says, I'll, I'll come and drive you from London to Surrey. I said, don't trouble. Don't trouble yourself. I will send you a taxi. I said, no, thank you. We can take the train. We took the train. But while we were going up the escalator in Victoria Station, I believe, going up the escalator and fell in the escalator or on the escalator. She fell downwards in an escalator that's moving up and she broke her arm. And I said, she, she came and said, it's so painful, I must have fractured my arm. I said, darling, there is a hospital nearby here, but in London, the hospitals are full. If you can bear with the pain, immobilize the arm, I can tie, a, a find a scarf, tie a bandage for you, immobilize the arm. We go to Surrey, there's a hospital there, it's less crowded. She said, okay, we do that. We went to Surrey and then they examined the arm, they, they put it in a cast so that she can come back to Singapore and do the surgery needed. That was on a Saturday afternoon. On Sunday morning, she was with me in church and she was ministering to the people. By Sunday evening, I received a, a email, an email from the senior pastor. He said, we were deeply touched and so inspired to wash Anne with her arm in cast and in pain. And yet she's laying hands on the congregation members and she was praying and ministering to them with a cheerful spirit. Why could she do that? Because the focus is not upon herself. It's not about spiritual consumerism. It's not about what's in it for me. It's all about the grace and the calling of God. Now, I know what some of my friends may be thinking. If God is there, how come He could not prevent the fall? I don't have that question. 
I can only give thanks. I tell you why. I, my thanksgiving is, Lord, you were there. I'm so thankful it's only her hand that's fractured. It's not her head that's broken or something worse. You see, we can either complain about the bad things we see happen and then take for granted that it could be more serious, it could be more severe. Whatever it is, whatever condition, it is the presence of God that makes that difference whether we complain or we give thanks. There's a third lesson Asep learned in the sanctuary. The first was that his evaluation of life was from the wrong perspective. The second, his goal in life was of the wrong desire. And the third lesson he learned was that his foundation in life was of the wrong hope. Listen to what he says now in verse 23, 24. Verse 23, Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. The focus is not on him. In the past, it was I, I, I. I give up, but I cannot give up. I try to understand, but I cannot understand. Now it's you. You hold my right hand. It's an idiom for sponsorship. And there are two basic ideas to sponsorship. Provision and protection protection and provision. God will protect. God will provide. The question is, who's holding your right hand? In the sanctuary of God, Asap recognized it is God who holds my right hand. It is God who is my foundation. That is why he, the psalm ends with a beautiful crescendo. Listen to how he says it now in verse 25 onwards. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you, the right desire. Verse 26, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever, the right foundation, the right hope. Verse 27, For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you, the right perspective. Then he comes to this great crescendo. It's like the diamond in the diamond ring. It's like the crescendo in the musical. In verse 28, But as for me, meaning in my personal experience, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I might tell of all thy works. What a beautiful psalm. You see, in the psalm, the musician and the composer has a prophetic assignment. And in fulfilling that prophetic assignment, there is a revelation that is given to us right here in Psalm 73. Don't just focus upon the wicked, or upon their prosperity or the temporal things of this world. Enter the sanctuary of God. Because in the sanctuary, you gain perspective. In the sanctuary, your desires are purified and sanctified. In the sanctuary, you find, you find your foundation, your strength the anchor of your soul. And once we're able to do that, once we get the right perspective, the right anchor, everything else changes. There's a sense of intentionality. There's a sense of clarity. There's a sense of a missional orientation to our life. We are living for something that matters. We are living for something greater than ourselves. My time is caught up with me. I want to close with this testimony, a simple one. 14 months ago, I was ministering in Chicago. In the conference uh, place, in the facility, it's a large hotel. Every morning when I go to the conference room, I pass by the concierge. And I stop to talk to a man by the name of Thai. I want to share the gospel with him. As I converse with Thai, I realize he is a Christian. And so we shared together our Christian faith and he was very excited as a disciple of Jesus. And then I said to Thai, Thai, one of this evening when I'm here in this conference, I'd like to bring you and your wife Paula for dinner with my wife. He was very excited, told the wife, but the wife was a bit reticent. He told me my wife is, is a bit shy and reticent. She's thinking, what conversation can I have with a Singaporean pastoral couple? But she came, and then the daughter Ashley, who is at home, now texts the mother, because the mother was sharing about this dinner she's going to have. So Ashley, the daughter, asked the mother, Paula, how was the dinner? And Ty gave me the reply that his wife gave 
to the daughter. Paula says this. She said, it is so incredible. It is so encouraging. The mission that God has given to this couple is so inspiring. And then she added, I believe that the Lord wanted my uh, wanted father and I to meet with this couple to get us off the couch into the battlefield. Off the couch into the battlefield. I thought to myself when I read that, wow, that's a good title for a book. <laughs> off the couch into the battlefield. I'm here to tell you that we have a battle. That spiritual warfare is daily. Satan doesn't have an off day, doesn't take an off day. I'm here to tell you discipleship is daily. Take up your cross daily and follow Him. But I'm also here to tell you the blessings of God is daily if we learn the secret in entering His sanctuary. Would you bow with me and pray? Oh, eternal God and heavenly Father, thank you for your wonderful word and the testimony and this prophetic message given to us by Esop. Lord, help us. Help us as Christians to come into the sanctuary of God. Help us, oh God. I'm going to pause for a moment and I'm going to invite you to a simple response. For those of you who have never invited Jesus Christ into your life, I want to encourage you to enter into the sanctuary of God, to embrace this spiritual life through this spiritual reality. It's not about religion. It's not about religious cliches. It's not about pet answers. It's about a living relationship with a living Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you say, how do I do that? You do that by simple prayer. Your prayer is in just three simple things. Lord, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Thank you for Jesus coming into my life. Lord Jesus, save me and change me. I'm going to lead you in that prayer, sentence by sentence. And if you have never prayed to receive Jesus, I invite you right now to pray this prayer with me. Because when you pray this prayer, you're entering to the Holy of Holies. You're entering the sanctuary of God. And God is there to change your life and transform you. Because the things of this world will never satisfy. Only Jesus can. So right now, as you bow your heads and close your eyes, if you have never prayed this prayer before, pray with me right now. Dear God, I'm sorry I've sinned against you. Please forgive my sins. Thank you for sending Jesus who died on the cross for my sins. Lord Jesus, please come into my life and change me. I enter your sanctuary this day. If you have prayed this prayer with me right now, would you raise up your hand high? I want to pray for you. I want to seal this prayer right now. Yes, God sees your hand. God sees your hand. God sees your hand. If you have never prayed this prayer before, but you have prayed this right now, would you raise up your hand? I want to pray for you. Anyone else? Yes, God sees your hand. Anyone else? I'm not a salesman. I'm a pastor. I'm, I, don't, I don't want to prolong this. I don't want to pressurize you. One last time, if you have prayed this prayer, would you raise your hand high? I want to pray for you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, God sees your hand. So Heavenly Father, I pray for these hands that are risen up. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, you draw them into your sanctuary that they might know the living Saviour, the living Lord. Now for the rest of us, you may put down your hands. Now for the rest of us, you are Christians. You got to learn the joy of entering the sanctuary of God. If you say this day, that's my heart's desire. I want to gain the perspective. I want my desires to be sanctified. I want my foundation to be sure. I want to move from the couch into the battlefield with victory. Right now, would you raise up your hand? I want to pray for you. If that's your desire, there are many hands going up here. One last time, if this is your desire, raise up your hand. I want to pray for you. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray for these many hands that are coming up right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, draw us into your sanctuary that we might gain perspective, that we might be sanctified in our desire, that we might be deepened in our foundation. For you work a mighty work in your wonderful holy sanctuary. Draw us into this holy of holies. Draw us in intimacy in your sanctuary 
We thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. And the people of the Lord say, Amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Edmund. Shall we all rise and stand in the presence of God? I'm going to ask Pastor Caleb to lead us in a chorus. And for those of you who have lifted up your hands, I want to encourage you to take one more step to come to the front at the altar. We want to pray for you. We want to minister to you. The psalmist says in Psalm 77, that your way, O God, is in the sanctuary, who is so great a God as our God. You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength amongst the people. Some of us here, especially those who have responded, lift up your hands, lift up your hands. I want to encourage you to come to the front and that we can pray for you. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Amen. Let's come into the sanctuary of God. Let's press in for more of God this day. No, my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful, Lord. And all my life you have been faithful. Yeah. And all my life you have been so Just come, the come to the front of God. And I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Bless you, God. We bless you, Lord. Lord, we, bless you, Lord. We, bless you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for those who have responded to your word in the front and those who have responded for salvation. We want to thank you that this is the work of God, Lord, that only in your sanctuary, Lord, can we find the answers and the revelations and the breakthrough in our lives, God. God, we want to enthrone you, Lord, as Lord and King over our lives, Lord. We thank you for your word this morning. We pray that you will seal your word in our hearts, God, that we may go forth, Lord, and bring you all the joy and all the honor and all the glory. And so, God, we pray, bless your people this morning. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord makes His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and grant you His peace. And may the Lord put His name on you. The blessings of God the Father, the blessings of God the Son, the blessings of God the Holy Spirit be in you and abide with you now and forevermore. And everybody say, Amen. Let's give the Lord one big praise.